You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The house and one day, the rest of my siblings was huddled in the back room and I went down to see what was going on this time. And uh, I saw all my brothers together in a huddle, so I forced my way in protesting to have a look at what's going on. And they had a gun. And now remember, they were handing it around, you know, and everyone's saying, wow, they're looking at it. And I was only about six, but I, you know, I said, let me have a, let me have a look. And, and you know, as it went to get passed to me, the brother up from me, he grabs it and he wants another look. So I start complaining. So my eldest brother says, no, you know, give it to him, let him have a look. And I just remember how impactful that was. So, you know, you're turning up 20 grand, 25 grand, you're buying a box or whatever, half a box of loose. And then this fella's got a mate who's got it and he knows a fella who's going to bring it. And then all of a sudden you're saying, shall I come bring something? Shall I bring someone else? Or no, nah, come on your own. And then shall I go and get a strap or something? And then my mate, he got locked up for popping someone. And then at one stage of my life, bruv, and I was up, some weekends I make five grand a day. Just, you know, it can happen. Like, And there were people making way more dough than I was, bruv. I was the nice guy of the group. So firstly, that little coffee shop job, you know what was beautiful about that? To be able to get up there and have meaning, have direction, have a purpose. So I'd go along and slap my apron on and show people like, what's he doing? He's working a coffee shop. But mate, after that shift was over, bro, I felt like a man of character, bro. I'm paying the bills and that, you know what I mean? So it was a wonderful feeling. Boom, we're on. Yes, James. Yes, bro. And today's guest, we've got Claude Jackson. How are you, Claude? Very well. Thanks for having me, James. I appreciate it, mate. Thanks for coming here. Your book, yes. Guns to God, powerful, just released a few weeks ago. Yes. Like, boy from Brixton, you've been all over the place. Yeah. Drugs, guns, money, yeah. had it all. And then you've wanted to go down a different route and change your life. I respect yes. that, bro. This is what these platforms are all about and for people not to try and go down that route yes. because we know how fucking delusional it is but fair play for making the changes to try and better your life brother I respect yeah. that yeah thank you first of all how's things yeah it, it's it's well it's well life's good bruv I'm on my last my final year of studies in regards to theology and the path I'm on which we'll speak about more so I'm on my last year but I'm not academically gifted bro I'm not born to do uh, college and uni so it's been tough but I'm counting the Mondays, counting down the weeks, and God willing, I get this final year out of the way. Yeah, you will, will come. You just yeah. got to keep working hard. Look how far you've already come, brother. Yeah. But I always go back to the start with my guests. Yes. Where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm from a multicultural background, dual heritage. So my dad was Jamaican, my mum was English. And uh, we grew up in Tooting. So I'm one of six. I'm the youngest. I've got four older brothers and one older sister. And... Um, yeah, my nan lived in Brixton. Like I said, we were in Tooting. And it, childhood was turbulent, to say the least, because it was such a dysfunctional household. My dad was such an aggressive individual. And there was domestic violence in the house. And um, we were really raised with the mentality that if someone starts on you, hit them. And if they hit you, hit them back. So imagine having four older brothers... I'm going out with that mentality and we're all conditioned to, to, to think that way. So school was rough. I didn't really go to school much. And when I was there, I quickly learned the attention and validation I got from my family and my siblings was if a fight took place or something, you come home and they, you know, they say, so what did you do? You know, and they want to know. And if you said, well, I hit him, then everyone would cheer or you know what it's like. So there was a lot of that going on at a very early age. And uh, my eldest brother moved out the family home uh, due to his own reasons, whether that was due to how dysfunctional it was or... And he went to live with my nan in Brixton and the rest of us stayed in Tooting. But once a month or so, he was in his early teens, he'd come back to the home 
And whenever he came home, he would bring treasures and weapons and stories of his adventures that he'd been on. So obviously us all being his younger siblings, when he came home, he was like Superman returning because we had all lived such restrictive lives, not playing out, not getting that poverty, anger, aggression. The house was just filled with trauma and turmoil. So when my brother would come home, we'd all listen to his stories of violence and fights and whatnot. So it was intense upbringing. So you never went to school much then? No like primary school? Nothing? No, no. I, we know, I never went to nursery. So when it comes to going straight into primary school, I just didn't have the social skills to fit in. And I remember I was always like the last one to complete the task. And the other kids would you know, the teachers would tell a story in the afternoon and all the kids would go and sit on the carpet and the teacher would make me, I'd have to stay at my desk until the task was complete, which didn't often happen because I just didn't have that skill set. So I'd be crying and then I just wanted to stay home anyway. So my mum would let me stay home more often than not. And I remember actually one occasion when the social services done a random visit because I hadn't been to school much. And they caught my brother and my sister playing out the front in the front garden. And I saw them from the window and I was only, you know, five, maybe six. And I quickly ran and laid down in bed and pretended to be asleep. And when they come through the door, my mum said, look, he's not very well. My mum was an absolute legend. He's not very well. And the social worker said, yeah, I can see he's not very well, but I was pretending to be asleep. So that was the sort of, yeah, absolutely. So when I was in school, um, and this went on to up until like eight, nine, ten. I just felt different. I wasn't equipped for, for school. And uh, the eldest brother I said that went to move out to my nan's, uh, he had a huge impact on my life. He really was my superhero. I wanted to be everything like him. But when I was younger, um, like I said, he'd bring things to the house. And one day, the rest of my siblings was huddled in the back room and I went down to see what was going on this time. And uh, I saw all my brothers together in a huddle. So I forced my way in protesting to have a look at what's going on. And they had a gun. And now remember they were handing it around, you know, and everyone's saying, wow, they're looking at it. And I was only about six, but I, you know, I said, let me, have a, let me have a look. And you know, as it went to get passed to me, the brother up from me, he grabs it and he wants another look. So I start complaining. So my eldest brother says, no, you know, give it to him, let him have a look. And I just remember how impactful that was. Firstly, I just remember thinking my brother is an absolute legend because I'd only seen guns and that on television. And then I was just really impacted at the weight of it and how cold it was. And, you know, anyone's you know, you don't have to have held a gun, but anyone that's held a gun, you just know instantly it's made for nothing other than destruction. So imagine going to school, six, seven, eight years old, that's going on at home, domestic violence, your dad, and then my brother went to prison and uh, one of my friends in school, I didn't tell anyone. So I'm instant, I'm only like eight years old, and I'm carrying these secrets. And I didn't tell anyone. And my friend, he was my best mate at the time, you know. And I felt I was, could I could confide in him. So I told him. And I told him not to tell anyone. And what did he do? He went and told everyone about my brother. Because in those days, people weren't in prison like they are now. So I had that scrutiny. My anxiety went up from a young age. Suffering with paranoia. I'd say I probably dealt with depression at about that sort of age. I didn't know it at the time, but my brother was gone. He was gone for Christmas. He went to Pentonville. I wasn't allowed to go and visit him. Um, so I was just carrying a lot from an early age, yeah. yeah. Why is the connection with your, your big brother always that? Look, is that because he's the bigger one looking up to him the most and yeah. more thinking it's more glorified to then try and be like your bigger brother? I think, like you said, A, because he's the bigger brother, but B, he got out the house in his early teens. Like I said, I went to live with my nan in Brixton. Yeah. And we were still there and it was so regimented. Like I love my parents to death. Unfortunately, they've both passed on now, but it was so regimented. My dad was so strict and everything was just aggression. 
So when my brother got out, he's coming back with his trainers. He started his career in crime. He's coming back with his trainers and his jackets. He just looked like Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, he was just, I guess yeah. he had the freedom what we all wanted. wanted. Did so, you ever run away? No, but I definitely did think about what life would be like if I did. Is that why it was such a, like, turned on when you seen your brother getting out and coming back and you're thinking, it's a better life out there because it was so hostile in the household? Yeah, yeah, and he was very charismatic on top of that. He was one of the most charismatic people I've ever met in my life. Charming, he carried himself well, you know, so he just looked, he, he, had, a lot, he had a reputation anyway in Brixton and two, and he had that reputation, but he was definitely charismatic and he obviously had the key to freedom. Yeah, what about secondary school? I, I attended secondary school even less. For the first two <clears throat> years, I was there in school in Tooting and um, it was just a lot of violence again, a lot of fighting and come the beginning of the second year, they said, you know, basically either you leave or we expel you. And the thing is, my parents had a shop at the time in Brixton Hill, um, a greengrocer's. And the mad thing was, we were getting up at like 4 a.m. to go Covent Garden Market to get the stock. And I was getting dropped off at school at 5, 5.30 a.m. So I was getting there before the teachers, bruv, before the school even opened. And then some people would arrive at 7 a.m. And, but you know, at 8, 9 o'clock, I'm already exhausted. And then I had to go through the day and you're trying to study. You've been up since 4, 5 a.m. So then in my second year, like I said, coming up to my second year, they asked me to leave. And I moved at that time. Uh, we moved from Tooting to Mitcham. We had moved. And then the house in Mitcham got repossessed. And um, we all, everyone overnight literally had to move up to a very small townhouse in Surbiton which was a two bedroom house and there were seven of us, seven or eight of us. And due to lack of room, I used to sleep under the stairs. My two brothers would sleep on the front room floor. And my sister had the box room and my parents had the double room and we were just, we were just getting by. And then like I said, moved up to secondary school in, in Surrey. And I was like one of three, there was three people in my year that was a minority of color. And then the whole school was a boys' school, 500 pupils, 600 pupils. And it, made, it was just a war zone. The stuff I see happening to guys, to Asian kids and things like that. The two other kids of colour, one of them was racist to the other just to fit in. That's how psychologically screwed up it was. It was like jail, bruv. A lot of bullying going on. Oh, super amounts of bullying. Super amount. And I'm trying to find my feet because I've been raised violently. I didn't want to... You know, fresh start, new school and that. And uh, you just got flung into that pit of despair and violence, bro. So you just had to make your way. Because it's the first time I'd encountered racism um, in my entire life. Although my dad was from Jamaica and my mum was English, I never grew up, we never had one of those households where if there was an argument, your parents would racially abuse each other. We weren't like that. I never even, we were raised equally. We never knew we were different. Then boom, I'm in Surrey, this boys' school, and you just, not, mate, you're told you're different, you know what I mean? There would be racist remarks made during class and teachers would ignore it. What? Yeah, bruv. Yeah, brother. And what did you do back then? Was it just ignore it and accept that? I tried to. It's not, that's just, it's not physical bullying. It's also the mental torture that comes with that. Tried to, exactly. The, I'm already dealing with a lifestyle of trauma and 13 years old and my brothers weren't having it. So when they were out locally, they were just laying guys out and getting into all sorts of rucks. And then on top of the anxiety, people would come back to me. Oh, did you hear what your brother done? Saturday night, I heard your brothers had a riot. So, although I was a part of the dysfunction of school, very little of it overflowed onto me. It was just living with that reputation of my brothers, the dysfunction of school on a daily. I had arguments with the teachers. My brother come up to school once to the PE teacher, which didn't help, it just made things worse. And then um, I ended up, my uniform, by the time I was like 13, 14, it was a shirt and trousers. I was walking around with my trainers on and no bag, no blazer. And I, I got kicked out of almost every class. And I'd just either be sat in a hallway or a corridor. They give you a little single desk and a bit of paper. And that was it. And then less, less days at school. 
four days turn to three days, two days turn to one day. And by the time my exams come about, it weren't, it weren't happening. Did you already feel like a failure at such a young age? Yeah, I felt a failure before secondary school, definitely. So what was the plans coming out of school? Was it go straight into crime or was it maybe get a job? Or what was your, your vision to then yeah. do something with your life? Yeah, well, I, I, when I had a chat with my careers oh. advisor, I remember them saying, what do you want to do? What are you going to be by the time you know, you're a certain age? And I said, just successful. Because I knew like... I was already disqualified from academic studies. So that wasn't my place in life. And by the time I finished school, my friends went off to college, university, but without any qualifications, that's not an option. So by the time I was 16, I started selling cannabis. My dad died when I was 16. I finished school and uh, it was, it was uh, me against the world. How was that? when your dad passed away, was that, even though it was a hostile environment and probably done what he could have in his shop and try to raise Jesus as best as he could, he's probably raised you the way he's been raised also. Like, it's a, such a crucial age for kids, like between 12 and 18, like if they lose a parent or family members get, mum and dad get divorced, like you tend to see people slip and they slip fast because then the abandonment issues kick right in. So when you were going through that at 16, you'd already come from a fucked up life, from schooling, um, hostile environment in the household. How did you deal with, with his death? Did, was that the shackles off for you to then do what you wanted or did you try and think, okay, I'm going to try and do right to provide for my mum? It was conflicting. So a few years earlier, we lost the shops that we had and my dad was a builder and uh, my mum had to go back to work and it was conflicting. So when my dad passed, the crazy part is I wanted to be cool about it. So I was like, shackles are off. But my dad, mate, was such a soldier. He was such a warrior that he taught us, you know, I never saw my dad back down from anyone. I never showed it, even when he was going out, like, and he weren't very well, he never showed no, didn't bend, you know, at all, man, in this lifestyle, in this world. Never bent, never committed a crime, straight up, worked six days a week. And, I, and you got to admire that. And before, before he passed, we had a little chat. He said, Claude, look after your mum and that. And, you know, don't smoke the weed, you know. And I was like, I was left with that. That was, that was his parting message to me. And I, I, I weren't equipped for the world. So it was shackles off for all of us. We definitely hit the ground running. But at the same time, I loved him in all of the madness, you know, because he firmed it the whole way. He just soldiered it out the whole way. So I respected that about him. So it was shackles off, though. It was. Yeah, instead of taking his advice, you went down the other route. Off, bruv. To block out the pain. Block out the pain. What so, kind of stuff were you involved in? Like I said, I started selling uh, weed, cannabis, skunk. And then um, my peer group, I was selling to them. My older brother introduced me to selling cannabis. So I was getting that supply off of him. And then... Um, I started to go back to Tooting because we moved up to Surrey. I started catching the bus back down so I wanted to see some of my school friends. And I met them and I met a ton of other people. And it's so vibrant and colourful. And I love South London through and through, you know. I love London, but I love South. And, um, mate, there were some superstars. I call them street stars. They were just legends on... This is before social media, you know, and... Uh, I saw that lifestyle and there were people like me who come from nothing and made, they were making something for themselves. And at that time, I didn't care how you did it, I'm going to do it, you know. And I met a couple of people who were definitely legends within their right. And one of which introduced me to credit card fraud. And um, again, I didn't even know what I was doing. I just took the cards because well, you just wanted more. It was just like Oliver Twist. And I just went out and started swiping and... Uh, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of chaos. And before you know it, I was about 19, had my first convertible and um, realised, or what I thought I realised, I asked this chap, basically, who was, seemed to be fairly successful. I said, you know, he said, Claude, if you want big money, you've got to take big risks. And my, although my cannabis line was popping, I, I said, boom, most of them are asking for coke when I, you know, Fridays. 
So I could kill two birds with one stone because when they're buying the weed, they're buying the coke. And at that time, I just wanted to be like the greatest street trader in the world. So I wasn't, this isn't a story of import and export or anything like that. I was just getting as much as I could, breaking it down and hitting the street with it. Yeah. yeah. So you're making money, you're getting your convertibles, you're starting to get a bit of attention and power for being, feeling worthless your whole life, feeling insecure, feeling lost, don't feel a part of society, to then becoming a wee bit popular. That's why people keep on that journey because they feels they're part of something. Yeah. And that's the fucking scary part. That's the scary part. Even though they're becoming more dis distant and disconnected. Yeah. So when you're making moves and you're starting to make a bit of money, what's life like then? So, um, it was a mad one because just to backtrack a couple of years when I was in school, the racism was going on and all of that. Um, we went to a little youth club after school and it was run by a bunch of religious folk, Christian folk. And it was all mumbo jumbo to me. But the following Monday, one Monday, they um, came to assembly and I was thinking, what are they doing in school? Like, these are that lot, you know. For God's sake, don't tell everybody. I'm I didn't know why they were there, I thought, you know. But they, they rocked up and this chap gave a talk in assembly. He was an ex hells angel and he said that he'd encountered Christianity and Jesus changed his life. So I was like, wow, that's intense. You know, I'm sleeping under the stairs at this stage. And then um, I asked the guys at the youth club if they could get me a Bible. And they said they would, but they never delivered. So that just made me a little bit more resentful. So then fast forwards, I'm 16, my dad passes, I'm 19, I got a convertible and I get into a horrific car crash. And um, I had to go to hospital and I had an operation on my arm and I was waiting on the bed. They had me in a little corridor to wait and put me in a room after the operation. And this lady comes along, West Indian nurse. And she says, Claude, you know, what's your name, honey? Boom, boom, boom. I tell her, she says, you know what, Claude? I'm not supposed to be working tonight. But I think I'm covering this shift because I was meant to meet you. So I'm like, and she says, you know, God's calling you. There's a fight over your life, you know. And at the time, I'm thinking, what is going on? Like, whatever. whatever. So she gives me her number. So I don't even do anything with it. As soon as I get out of hospital, bro, I've got to get some more bread, get back on track, sort my car out and that. And um, like I said, I started selling coke. And uh, in my teens, I got arrested for a different charge with somebody else and they couldn't press charges. But while I was in the cell, I was just thinking like, I started to pray, if I'm to be honest, because what do you do? You know, I just didn't, I'm running out of chances. So I started to pray that I'd get out of it all, all right. And I did. And then I, you know, and also the car crash, I met this woman and then my brain's thinking the fella from school, what's going on? So the whole time I'm out on the front line selling gear and all of that, I'm trying to explore what's going on in life. And um, this happens up until my mid twenties and I was doing very well for myself, a lot of, a lot of doing very well. And um, at about 32, I was about 30, 32. I um, started to mentor young offenders. Uh, an opportunity came up and I applied for the role because I just thought, you know, when you've been in the game 20 years, bruv, 17 years, day in, day out, selling gear, never been to prison, arrested twice, let go without charge. And one of those times, the second time that I got arrested, I had a, less than a grand in, in my wallet and I went to, I think it was Fort Eneath, police station, they arrested me in Croydon and um, took your stuff, you know, and then um, they let me out to like the weekend later, the maximum time they could keep me. And then I uh, went to reception to ask my stuff back and they gave me the empty wallet. And I said, where's my money? And they were like, oh, what money? Like, Steve, you seen any money? Steve's like, no, I ain't seen any money. So I thought, you know what, the laws, this is madness. So um, you've got enemies on road trying to plot on your downfall and now you've got the police stealing your dough. And they said to me, we know what you're up to, Claude. You know, we know what we're doing, what you're doing. So they was aware of what I was doing. So fast forward a few years later when I was mentoring the young offenders, I knew I needed something an alibi because I spent near on 20 years drug dealing. So I started doing that on a voluntarily basis, which meant you can go 
when it chose when you chose to basically, and um, the manager it was for the council and the manager at the council, he was up there you know he had authority and I go along, and I'd have you know I don't know, three hundred pound jeans on four hundred pound jacket whatever. And every day I'd stroll in, so they gave me a desk in the offices at the council. So you can imagine what I was like, young man. I used to be in the gym every day. Ego was bigger than an air balloon. And um, I'm at my desk, swiveling round on the chair, because I've got nothing else to do. Everyone else is typing away. And this chap used to come in and he used to say, hello, Claude, good morning, how are you? And I was so taken back that he was showing an interest in me. And, mate, if I was a circle, he was a square. Like, if I was a lion, brother, he was a hedgehog. He really... It was just a different type of guy. And then, um, you know, I'd rock up in one of, one of my cars, park it in the car park at the window of the offices so everyone could see. Were you still active at that point? Still active. <clears throat> still active. And um, he was cycling to work or catch a bus or something like that. Humble guy, lunchtime. So I'd be like, who's coming to lunch? It's on me. And he'd always politely decline and say he's got a packed lunch. So I couldn't really, couldn't ruffle his feathers. He couldn't was, manipulate him. Couldn't manipulate him. He was just ticking on a different, had a little white shirt, who'd just wear a shirt, some chinos. Humble, grounded guy, man. And um, at this point, me and my mates, my mates buying like 40 grand cars. I'm buying 30 grand cars, you know, guns, all sorts of going on in our spare time on the weekends. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a day, a team building day, where no matter who you are that worked for the council, you, whether you was a volunteer or a worker, you had to go along. So at this team building day, you had to do an icebreaker. There was maybe 100, 150 people in the room. And I didn't really want to go, because I was like, I'm only a volunteer, do you know what I mean? But you had to go. And I remember they said, uh, we're all going to take a turn, stand up. You know those icebreakers you're just thinking of? So there was one lady, bless her, just to give you an example of what it was like. There was one lady who said, um, introduced herself and she says, uh, what nobody knows about me. So you had to introduce yourself and say one thing no one knows. She gets up and she says, what no one knows about me is I buy a bar of chocolate after work and I eat it on the bus by the time I get home. So that was the type of squares. I was thinking, oh gosh, you know, I was like, these lot are so square, it's unbelievable. And then matey, the boss of the bosses, that fellow who was always saying morning to me, it comes to his turn. And I'm like, oh mate, what's, now I've got him. Because I couldn't ruffle his feathers, but he's going to say something so boring, isn't he? He's just going to... And he stands up and it's quietly confident. It was unreal. And he says, um, he introduces himself and he says, what no one knows about me. And he produces a little box and he produces a little crucifix and he holds it up and he says, I'm a Christian and Jesus changed my life. And mate, I don't know why, yeah? But at that moment, it's just like, I couldn't get it. Like it was just mind blowing for me. Because I thought, uh, you know what sort of life I'd live, bruv, to conquer my demons, to, to, to engage with my fears. And then this little fella stands up as cool as a cucumber, as solid as a rock, and declares something like that. And I just wanted to know more. I remember just thinking, what, what type of petrol is he running on that he gets his confidence from that? Because my confidence comes from life experiences. I need to conquer women. I need to conquer guys. I need to conquer the law. I need to outsmart everyone. I need cars, money. You're just so empty inside, bruv. So um, I, I, he had to shoot off, but I went and pinched him. And I said, mate, you know, he said, I've got to catch a train, Claude. I'm terribly sorry. And I said, I'll give you a lift, you know. He said, and he, no, no, it's fine, Claude. I got to. And I said, mate, get in the car, bruv. And he looked at me, I don't know if he was more concerned or I was, but we were mm -hmm. definitely intrigued. Why uh, was there so distance towards you, like kind of blockages there, not to really let you in, not to really... Do you think he felt your presence was a bit off, your energy was a bit off, that it wasn't your time? Like, want to go for lunch, he would kindly decline, want to get in the car, he would kindly decline. Did you think he's seen that you were still rough around the edges? 
I think what was interesting is I think you're absolutely right. He knew I was rough around the edges, but he wasn't he wasn't compelled or impressed by the money or the cocky attitude or the big ego. So he would engage with me and say morning. No one else would say morning to me. They'd all walk past. No, I don't know if they were scared or just worried or didn't want to know, but no one else would say a word to me. You know, one or two colleagues of mine would have a bit of banter and we, but he was always polite, always addressed me, but didn't allow himself to appear impressed by my persona. Did that annoy you? That somebody wasn't buying your bullshit? Yes. Yeah, because I want to know. It, like, you ain't got to love me, mate. You can hate me, but I guarantee you I invoke an emotion in you. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened once again in your car? So I just asked, I said, it's a fascinating, because I never, I never really, to my memory, had encountered a Christian before. Um, so I said, it's fascinating what you said. Where can I find out more? And he said, have you heard... Um, of an alpha course. And I'm, what's that? It's, you know, a 10 week course, introduction to Christianity, where friendly atmosphere, you could go along and find out more, no pressure involved. So I, I raced home, checked online. There happened to be a course starting locally the next day, signed up to that straight away. What do you think you were searching for? What was I searching yeah. for? I think at that point in life, Especially you were still active, especially you were still doing what you were doing to make a crust and having all the material stuff to then, usually people when hit rock bottom, usually when people are in prison, they search for something, inner peace, but you searched when, at the height of everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. Yeah, I just think what had become a reality for me is selling a couple of drawers down, to, down the park to your friends when you're 15, 16, you're now 30, 32, you're buying kilos and you, you can buy pretty much whatever you want. And then what's the point? Someone's getting shot, my friend's getting locked up, this other fella dies, the houses are getting raided, I lost count how much times my mum's house has gone, got turned over. And then what? And then what? So then what? Now that, now that you're in it full speed ahead, now what? You know, because anybody that's really made any real bread, you know, I don't care how much dough you got, you know it's just a means to an end. You, you're not getting, there's no substance to it. Yeah. So I think, I thought in my younger years, that stuff would give me uh, value and worth, self-worth. But when you get all of that and you risk your life doing it for 20 years and you're just, you're even emptier than you were when you started can't hold down a relationship. Women you were meeting were more broken than you are. Friends are psychopaths, literally. What's going on? So I went along to find out what these lot was on. And uh, it, was, it was interesting. When I turned up at the course, there was a lady who I'd corresponded with via email the night before, and she approached me and she said, oh, you must be Claude. And you know, she had a big smile when I was thinking, well, she, you know, what's going on? So then she put her hand out and shook my hand. And I'd never, mate, never in that my lifestyle, when do you ever shake hands with anyone? It's not like the films where the mafia, you shake hands yeah. and kiss each other, do you know what I mean? And I remember thinking, wow, she's treating me civilized, bruv. And then she invited me along and it was in a little sort of coffee shop and they had a little chat and it weren't nothing heavy. No one was trying to convert or brainwash anyone. So I said, you know, it's not too bad. Maybe after an hour or so, whatever, when it finished, I thought I'll come back the next week. And then the next week I pull up, park my convertible across the road, round the back so no one can see me. And I rock up and I said, there's that bird again, you know. I'm going to get her first. So I stick my hand out, boom. And she just opens her arms and hugs me. And again, mate, mind blowing. Like, what? I can't remember the last time I'd had a hug, bruv. Like, psh, it's like, unless you give a bird what she wants and they claim to love you, they don't only love you when it's working for them. But this woman's just, boom, hits me with a hug. And then I go into the coffee shop and there's a young fella in there who's a co-host. And I walk up and he says, Claude, how you doing, man? And I'm like, good, good. And then he hits me with a hug. And I was like, mate, you know our lifestyle, bruv? My community, if you compliment somebody, it's considered weakness. 
If I say I think you're awesome, mate, people look at me funny. Like, I'm a weirdo, bruv. And this fella's confident enough to give me a hug publicly and let... You know what? You get called for that sort of yeah, thing, brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I was like, these lot are on a different time, bro. And then, you know, I left. And my, the whole week, I was just thinking, you know, I'm still active at this stage, but I'm still thinking, what are these lot on? Because they are definitely running off a different type of fuel. And then the third week, I went along. And, you know, we watched a video and we had the coffee and we was invited to ask Jesus into our life if we chose to, bro. And you know, my ego was so big, yeah? I was so full of pride. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it just to prove nothing's going to happen, isn't it? I'm going to do it. Saying all of my cockiness, yeah? I'm such a fool, bro. I'm so empty. I closed my eyes, bro. And I said, I dare you. If you're real and you can do what these people say you can do, I dare you, Jesus, to come into my life and make a change. And I kid you not, bro, in that moment, I had my eyes shut, man. And it was like time stopped, bro. No word of a lie. It was so silent. I forgot anyone else was even in the, in the coffee shop. It was just the intimacy was so tangible. You could just feel it, like you could feel the moment, bro. And... I f it felt like I had my eyes shut forever, but I only had them closed for a few seconds. And when I opened them, I knew right there and then there had been a shift. And if I was going to make a change, it was going to happen right there and then. And that's when life started changing. Is that when you stopped doing what you were doing in the background? I was still active, bro. Yeah. I was still active. How long did it take for you to quit that? By the end of the 10-week course, I told the, the, the vicar and uh, come clean... And I switched my blowers off and haven't switched them back on. What's your friend say at this time when you've, you're active, you're talking about guns and killings and drugs and all the bullshit of the day to then yeah. turn them the fucking... It's mad, bro. Turn the phones off to then... Yeah. What they, what they think? It was mad, bro. So my, my elder brother, he, when he finds out what's going on, he rings my mum up. And he tells my mum, he says, Claude's gone mad. Bible basher. Bible basher. Cuckoo. Lunatic. He's gone mad. He's, I was, he literally told my mum. And my mum's there, bless her, trying to defend me as she always did. Uh, he's not mad. He's not mad. I was in my room. I, could, I was living with my mum at the time. And I could hear her saying, he's not mad, you know. And I thought, like, some real people think I'm nuts. You know, and at that time, my social circle was very, very small anyway, because when you had that amount of work and that, and people, these were people whom you've been so accountable to your whole life. I knew secrets about them and they knew secrets about me that we'd never share. So they just knew, like, if I'm saying I want out, yeah, no matter what my motivation was, they respected it because they were respectable people. Uh, they knew what I was capable of and I knew what they were capable of. So they, you know, a few of the stragglers questioned it, mm -hmm. you know. How when you see, see when you're earning paper and you're doing well for yourself, the burner phones are going through the hook, like you're making proper paper, like how did your friends treat you? That Was there any paranoia that you would have got bumped or? Yeah, bruv. Like there's no fucking loyalty amongst thieves. Like, none. There's none at all. Like, but obviously when you grow up with people, there's a tight unit, but people grow apart. They begin to relationships, have kids. People just want to turn and uh, turn their life around and move on. But there's always that paranoia. Shit, he knows something. Yeah, that's when people end up getting took off the cars because uh, yeah. it's the worry of what happens. Then was there any of that with your friends? Yeah, it, and not just my friends, just the actual transactions. So it got sticky. So you know, you're turning up twenty grand, twenty five grand. You're buying a box or whatever, half a box of loose, and then this fella's got a mate who's got it, and he knows a fella who's going to bring it. And then all of a sudden you're saying, shall I come bring something, shall I bring someone else, or no, nah, come on your own, and then shall I go and get a strap or something, and then my mate, he got locked up for popping someone. And then at one stage of my life, bruv, and I was up, some weekends I make five grand a day, just, you know, it can happen, like, and there were people making way more dough than I was, bruv. I was the nice guy of the group. But they reached a point I wouldn't get changed until I got showered. 
So I've, I see, I had my shutters shut all the time. You know, I'm peeking through and um, I sleep on top of my bed, fully clothed, in case the hat door went. You don't know, is it the police? Is it drug dealers? Is it, who is it? Extortionists. So I'd have a shower, get changed, put more clothes on. This is how cuckoo your brain and berry and dough, bruv. This is how I know people exaggerate. You can't bury bread like that. It goes off, brother. So all these people that's films, boom, 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 I'm burying, you can't bury dough like that. And the other thing what people don't say, and it might have just been me, but I doubt it very much. If I heard any type of siren, police, car, fire, engine, ambulance, yeah? Your heart is banging, bro. I was doing getaways when I didn't even have to do getaways. I see cut a sirens in the mirror, bro, and I hit the gas, boom, I'm off. And I didn't even have to. I was just so, you're living so tense. You're so wound up. So when I, when I came clean about what I was doing, of course I had to get another job. And uh, I got a job as a barista part-time. I was earning £6.50 an hour. But that was a, the biggest game changer. Because at that time, I still had the motors, boom. But the, the shop I... Um, the coffee shop I began working in was in a no parking zone on the high street. And uh, there was no parking in the area. So at the time I had a Range Rover Sports on the drive, convertible Audi, and I had to be at the coffee shop for 5 a.m. And no night buses were running. So, you know, it's, it's November, December. Cold. Cold, dark, wet. And then I was like, mate, I got to walk, took two and a half, three miles to work. And you got 70 grand of cars, if not more, sat on your driveway. It's little moments like that, that will really make you question who you are, bruv. See, when you're active, yeah. how many times did the words that your dad say ring in your mind? Yeah, it's interesting. I stopped smoking weed long before I stopped selling it. Mm -hmm. And the whole time, I never... Be clear, I never did this for my mother. My mother was a stand-up woman with integrity. But it's nice when Christmas comes around. I went to Harrods and I said, I want a Christmas tree out the window. You know, it's nice having that option, seven-foot tree. It would make, I was so screwed up, the top of the tree would touch the ceiling mm -hmm. in the front room. Yeah. But there, my mum was, bless her. I was buying her stuff that, my mum had a jewellery box like a treasure chest. It was bananas, bruv. Let alone myself. Yeah. Because yeah. when my dad died, I was the same. Look, son, get your life in order. Yeah. And I never did. I slept for fucking many, over 10 years. And I used to sit at parties full of coke and booze. And I used to think, he used to always come into my mind as if to say, like, I used to see him think, shaking his head and think, what the fuck are you doing? Because before he died, I remember I was in the sleep, back in my mum's house as well. And we were sleeping, it must have been about four in the morning, but he was in another room. And I heard him shouting, James, James, listen. And I always played in my fucking mind. So when I used to sit and get mad with it, I used to hear that voice. And I used to think, what the fuck am I doing? Am I tripping balls? Am I, am I hearing something? Like, I used to always play in my mind. And now obviously I'm in a good place. That voice goes. So I don't know if there's people out there that you can hear voice. I don't know what the fuck it is. But it was always, I don't know if it was just me tricking my mind to try and give myself the shake to make the changes. So seeing your dad saying that, are you and your life's going down how you're fucking up, yeah destroying other people's lives to buy Christmas trees at Harrods, like, was it ever in your mind that you wanted to change for your dad as well? It's a great question. I think I wanted to be my parents to be proud of me. Mm. But before I started to make, there was a stage after my dad died and we had to move house. We ended up in a council flat on an estate, which is fine, but it wasn't in a house what we were used to. Me and my mum, for a period of life, was eating bread sandwiches for dinner. You, she, I'd have two slices, she has one. And then, you know, the, you ever seen the penny jar go empty, bruv? Like, when you're dealing with that level of poverty, and by the time, 10 years later, and I could pretty much buy whatever I wanted within reason, um, my dad's voice got quieter and quieter. And I was like, Dad, you were a... So he was a warrior. My dad was a soldier. So he knows your son's out here on the front line every day, bruv. I'm just thinking about what he said. If they, someone starts on you, hit them. If they hit you, hit them back, bro. Um, bread will do that to you. 
Yeah. yeah. So when you started making the changes, when you've done your 10 week course and you're active and you're coming away from it, how did your life change for the better? Yeah. So firstly, that little coffee shop job, you know what was beautiful about that? To be able to get up there yeah, and have meaning, have direction, have a purpose. So I'd go along and slap my apron on and show people like, what's he doing? He's working a coffee shop. But mate, after that shift was over, bro, I felt like a man of character, bro. I'm paying the bills and that, you know what I mean? So it was a wonderful feeling. And then that October I got baptised. And that was that confirmed my thoughts. When I got baptised, man, I just felt brand new. Whether or not it happens, I felt brand new, bro. I can only share my truth with you. And I, I, when I came up out of that water, I said, yeah, this is it. I'm done with it. And sure, man, like, I had to sell my cars. I got rid of my car. I couldn't afford the lifestyle I once had. Um, and it's been difficult, bruv. But it's been worth it, mate. Did it strip away your ego? I think I'm stripping away my ego. That might be a journey that lasts the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly, it's certainly, you know, it's the fire that turns the silver into gold. Yeah, because I've got many friends in prison just now. I've got many friends who've been in and that are out and they would never get a job, ever. Ever. No matter if it was a grand a week, two grand a week, decent fucking wage, they would still knock it back because... Yeah. They don't believe in getting told what to do. Yeah. They think it's a, a mugs game. They see it as a weakness when really it's a strength to get up in the morning and put on fucking work clothes and go and do a shift and, and come back. Like I was like that mentality for so long. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't get told what to do because I thought I was. I would tell someone to fuck off. Yeah. Who the fuck are you talking to? It's a man who's created a business. It's given me an opportunity to provide my family, but I didn't see opportunities and I just seen problems and issues like I'll get no one will tell me what to do and yeah a lot of people are like that too much yeah. pride too much ego to then accept that go and get a job provide for your family stop making excuses like yeah. there's, there's plenty of jobs out there there is plenty of jobs if you want a job you can get one whether it's sweeping the streets or hotel port or whatever it is that there's good people out there who offer plenty of opportunities mm. so when you started working getting a month's wage what you could have probably made in one day back in the streets like mm. How long did you battle with that for? Was there any times doing that job where you thought, I'm going to go back being active because I'm, I'm scrimping and scraping? Mm. Especially when you take away travel expenses, food. You'd been probably getting coffees and, and food in there, but you take all that away, you're, you're, you're left with not much. So not much. was there times where you thought, I'm going to go back? In the beginning, no. It's been nearly eight years now, but in the beginning, no. For the first few years... Um, cause they say there's an old saying, isn't it? The measure of a man doesn't come from comfort and convenience, but from trial and tribulation. So I was enjoying learning about myself, bro. I never even knew what I liked. It was only a few years ago. I got my first pair of wellies, bro, which is absolutely laughable. But imagine in my lifestyle, when am I going to go for a country walk? I didn't even know what I liked, bro. Like that's madness that people don't even hobbies never had a hobby until a few years ago. It's like, people don't even know themselves. So I was enjoying knowing myself. The only thing where it got crazy is um, learning to live with the less money. And I ended up getting myself in a lot of debt. I was in about six and a half grand worth of debt. And the little money I could afford to pay off monthly was, um, wasn't enough. It was barely covering the interest. And uh, at that point, I managed to get a job at church, um, working in a homeless shelter. And there was other volunteers there, but I was being paid to work there as part. I began training, so to speak. And um, one Sunday, I was really losing sleep about this because I was six and a half grand, you know what I mean? I had that sort of throwaway cash before. And um, one of the chaps in church come up to me and uh, I was considered, you know, I was training so I wasn't you know and he said to me hi Claude how's things and I said good and I didn't really know the guy and he said um Claude how's your finances and if I'm honest bro my pride caught me in it and I thought who's he asking you know so I said yeah my finances are fine everything's lovely but I'm in six and a half grand for debt in, you know but I told him everything's lovely then when I walked away man I was like oh god why did I do that? 
I don't know what was going to come of it, but I'm trying to be a truthful chap, man. Yeah. The truth sets you free, brother. So I don't want any secrets. I don't want any darkness. Put light in the darkness, bro. And I walked away and like, for about three days, it eat me. It just, it was eating me. And I said, you know what, God, like, if someone else should ask me about my finances, I'm going to tell the truth because it's not every day. You know, when I met you, I didn't ask you about yours and you didn't ask me about mine. So for this chap to ask me, I thought it was a bit peculiar. So I promised myself, if anyone ever asks me again, I'll tell the truth. And then just, bro, ironically, coincidence, you call it, but a week later, someone else come up to me, said, hi, Claude, how's things? I said, yeah, very well, how are you? Yeah, well, how's your finances, Claude? And I was like, you know what, he's asked, so I'm going to tell him. I said, mate, I'm in debt. Six and a half grand, credit cards, I'm drowning out here, you know? And uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Claude. End of the conversation. And I thought, oh, me. You know, at least I told the truth. That's what I said I was going to do. A few days later, I get a phone call. A fella got my number, got in contact, and he said, Claude, I spoke to my missus, and we've decided we want to pay off your six and a half grand debt. You know, we're going to pay the whole thing off. And I was like this is mad, that's a small lottery win, isn't it? That's like six and a half grand. And he said, not only that, for the next few months, until you get on your feet, we're going to give you 500 pound a month. Bro, I don't know the guy, like, that's mad, bruv. Mm -hmm. They done exactly that. Paid off my, every debt I had. They asked me, give them the bills, they'll pay it all off and put 500 pound in my account for the next three months while I was getting on my feet. What do you think that is? I know there's good people out there who do good things, but do you think when you start becoming a better person, better things happen in your life? Uh, I think it was an answer to my prayers, but to answer your question, when I was a bad person, it, a lot of bad stuff <laughs> happened in life, bro. So I think it was an answer to my prayers. It was mad to witness that, and I've seen a couple of things happen like that. You know, and what... what one fascinating thing happened when I started working in the homeless shelter, there were a few volunteers there. And one of the volunteers was, I uh, must tell, tell this chap, Michael Emmett. And, uh, yeah, I know Michael. Michael Emmett is a fascinating guy. I love him to death. And um, there used to be a ping pong table in the homeless shelter. And mate, I was there after we served breakfast, you know, we got our plastic aprons on and we're doing our bit. And Michael's there, legend, volunteering. And uh, there's a few others, and there's a ping pong table in the corner. So some of the guys are playing, the homeless fellas. So I go over and I start playing. And I'm not bad, you know what I mean? We was giving each other a good run. And then Michael comes along, and he's such a he's beautiful character. And he says, oh, gentlemen, you know, do you mind if I have a go when you finish? May I have a turn? So I'm like, I reckon I could take him. It's Michael, isn't it? Mate. Michael's probably one of the best ping pong players in the entire country because yeah. he done God knows how long inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and he cleared up, bro. He was mm. clearing up. He cleared up. So a couple of years that I worked in that homeless shelter was lovely. Um, we had a lot of fun and I got to know Michael dearly and I met, um, not through the shelter, but through the church, Shane Taylor, another chap. Yeah, he's a good yeah. big guy, Shane. Mate, Two great guys. Like, one's a drug lord, one's... Wanted to kill people. Mm. Both been on this podcast. Like, I, like with religion and stuff, like, I'm open to it all. I've not followed one and I believe that this is what I believe in. This is what I'm going to preach, this and that. But I'm open to everybody's story. I'm giving everybody a... This is what these podcasts are so good because it's to get an understanding of everybody's lives. Mm. Why they were... How they were raised. The path they chose. And the path they've chose now. Like, mm. Doors open for different people at different times. It's just all down to you what doors you want to step in. Yeah. Like, I'm for anything, if it's helping you, helping yeah. other people around you, as long as you're not hurting anyone. Like, yeah. Life is a beautiful mess sometimes, and it's it has its wobbles, it has its moments, but all you can do is soldier on, keep swimming, and, and make sure you don't sink, which mm. is a difficult thing. People, we talk about mental health a lot, and when you're stuck on social media, when you're drinking coffee, taking drugs, and gambling, and just hating on yourself all the time, eating bad foods, talking shit, like, anxiety is high for a reasons because you're doing all of those things, like, mm. try and take away one at a time and you, you start, your vision starts to become clearer, like, everybody's kind of leaving the same clues on this podcast as to 
why they wanted to change and how they changed. Mm. First of all, they didn't like who they were, so they made sacrifices and adjustments to then go and better their life, which is a difficult thing because we're so caught up in a bubble where we step back into the life of chaos and misery because it's what we're ingrained to, it's what we're conditioned to believe it's a normal life, but it's not, man. Mm. Like, like I said there, it can be a beautiful journey if you want it to be. Obstacles still pop up. Mm. Problems still pop up, but it's how we react to those problems that... Like, I'm a learning, like we spoke earlier on the podcast, I'm still learning, bro, that I don't have all the answers, but look what I'm achieving over the last three, four years, it can be done, but I need to be as honest as I can be to people, like, mm. it ain't an easy journey, but with making the negative adjustments and taking them out of your life, posit- it, it makes room for the positives to come in, and then you start seeing the world differently, and when you see the world differently, then new things happen, like it is, mm. it's, um, it's a crazy fucking experience, this life, but... It's also a it's also a beautiful one when you when you truly see the beauty in life because you can walk out in the street and see so many negatives raining, people not happy, but then you can see fucking thousands of thousands of beautiful things if you tr- if you truly want to see it as well. It's just the way you want to look at the world. But when you're going through all those adjustments, like you're coming across guys like Shane Taylor, that like he was on the podcast, broke down, wanted to kill people all the time, like. Mm. You look at him, you think you're a fucking psycho. I'm mm. going to be honest, Michael, good guy, but then you're thinking all the drugs he used to import, and you're mm. thinking another crackpot. Mm. Then yourself, and you talk about your backstory. That we're all kind of crazy mm. in our own certain way, but people can make changes, and that's the beautiful thing that I will always promote. A lot of people say you can repeat myself with this sort of stuff, but I might have new listeners, and then. I've also got people listening all the time because if I say it enough, then they'll truly start believing in it. Mm. And that's when they can start making the changes. Mm. So when you're making all these people and then changing your life, how your mum must have been proud. Mm, yeah, bro. And I think just to touch on the mindset thing, mate, it's like, what would you rather be, alive and a dog or dead and a lion? You know? And we got this mindset where they'd rather us shut up instead of speak up. But mental health is a real reality within our community. And the thing is, we have this tradition in this this culture of like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So there's people who are too proud to say, but all they're doing is drowning in their own toxicity and anxiety. And they're going to drown, bro. They're not going to make it out because they're not speaking up. And we've got to change the narrative that it's cool to ask for help, man. You've got to tell someone, do you know, in the zoo, they toss the monkeys bananas. Not because that's all they'll eat, just because that's all they'll ever accept. So what do you think is going to happen? The monkeys are only going to have bananas for the rest of their lives, bro. They'll eat so much more. And that's a shut up, not speak up mentality. So we need to change the narrative. If I don't feel well, bro, I'm telling someone. Mental health is, if not just as important, if not more important than physical health. These are things within the community we need to highlight. But um, to answer your question, yeah, my mum... Mate, my mum was so thorough. It's unreal. Because, you know, at one point, and I'm sure, you know, she's passed on now, God bless her. But what was crazy, yeah, this is how polluted I was. A lot of this stuff my mum was doing the driving for, which is madness. And I'm not proud, mate, I've made so many mistakes. I'm not proud of anything I've done. Trust me, trust me, bro. But my mum, it got to a point where my mum was coming and she was only five foot, bless her, you know what I mean? And it got to a point where people, my other social circle would say, listen, mate, I'd love for your mum to drive my motor for me across. Of course, I'd never let her, but she was turning up. My mum's been around some of the most lethal criminals in London and never said a word, bruv. Got her house raided. Never spoke a word of it, bruv. And went out like my dad, mate. When they passed on, they were so firm. Stood firm in it. Never broke. Never broke down, bro. Just held it, whatever came. Embraced the fear of the unknowing. And we can't even live in this secular world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But she got to see you thrive and make changes. Like you say there, if she's dropping off parcels or doing this, you're just thinking in your mind, because you're conditioned to give her an earner so she can eat better and have a better Christmas, have a better life, pay her bills. Like, you're not seeing anything wrong at the time where I would grow up. Like, everybody had an earner for somebody if they wanted it. Yeah. No matter if it was a fucking woman at 16, a girl at 16 or a woman at fucking 100. If yeah. somebody wanted to make paper, the, nobody's thinking of the consequences. Yeah. That's how fucking That's how deluded people are. Like, 
if people want to make money, there was always earners for people to make money from any age, any fucking colour, any any gender. Yeah. There, there was earners there, even though it was some of the worst ones that people were trying to make 250, 500 quid. Yeah. Like, back in the day, it was, it was normal. normal. And you know what's amazing, Brasha? She never got anything out of it. She just loved me so much. She never done drugs. My dad never done drugs, none of it. She didn't ask for a penny her whole life. You know, some people say, I'll do it if you do this or pay the rent or she never asked for a penny. So she did it for nothing other than love for me. And I never sent her out on her own. I was always with her and I never let her do any work for anyone else. But my mum was so, uh, my mum loved me unconditionally. But she got to see you making your changes. She got to see me begin my studies, religious studies. Unfortunately, she never saw the book come to fruition, but um, she knew about it. She knew about the whole thing. You know, my mum was such an advocate of me. She was the only one who ever championed me. Even when I lost and took an L, bruv, she used to say, don't worry about it. So what? What's the worst that can happen? You know, they pounded my cars and whatnot, and uh, I had to get them back, and my mum handled the legal side of it. She, They're not going to take your cars. They ain't got any right to do that. And she got on the phone, and she's calling about, and she's proving how I got them legally. You know, stood stood for me the whole way. So, but but now I'm in I'm in, uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm in my final years of study. God willing, next year I'll be ordained. So I'm training to be a priest in the Church of England. So I get the collar in that, and we're changing the narrative from the inside out. What way? Everybody's welcome. I don't know. Sometimes there's a lie in life that church is only for the upper class. Um, type of people or people ain't good enough for church but Jesus hung next to the criminals bro you know and they, and uh, if you really read the word read the bible Jesus was for the people brother Jesus God is for the people I don't know why people will say oh, I'm too bad for church or I'm too bad for heaven if you knew how wrong that was there's it's impossible you could never be too bad for heaven God loves us because yeah. he made us, man. Why do you think a lot of people who do make those changes in turn to Christ come from prison? A lot of men. Turn like, men get a rough ride. Like, men battle a lot, not just with mental health, but the majority of men that are in prison, the majority of people in prison are men, the majority of people are homeless are men, like, the majority of people who die in wars are men, like, the majority of people who are suicidal are men, like, the majority of people who get fucking... Um, assaulted our men like we, 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 it's a, a tough life for a man like women have got it tough as well but mm. suicide rate's so high men because we are the ones who are I, I believe personally that we are weaker than women I believe we are the weaker gender like even mm. though we are man we are warriors should be hunters but we don't express our feelings and our emotions much where mm. suppressing it all eventually comes to a head and the pressure's just too much that like people just want to end their life and that's it's a scary place to be like I've never been suicidal myself. I've had suicidal thoughts with drinking drugs and thinking, fuck me, what's the point of being here? Or would people miss me if I died? Like, you go over it, but I never had the bottle to end your life. And it's scary to think that people think it's a better way of taking your life than actually riding it out here and trying to make changes. That's to feel hopeless and helpless. Like, that's a sad place to be in a man. Like, it's just if we had the, the remedy and to help everybody we could but we can't we just need to make ourselves strong and hopefully it guides others out of darkness like I say I'm not for one religion or the other like, I'm open to everybody open to your story like Michael's and Shane's and everybody on this platform is different to tell their story and somebody will watch this and go do you know what because I've had many addictions when I used to go to like NA and GA um, a lot of people used to turn to Christ I never went down that route but the people who did it, it helped them they've focused on an energy and they've They've run with it and it's totally transformed their life. 20, 30 years, they're still clean, they're not gambling, they're not taking drugs. Like, people watch this and think, fucking, the Bible bashing shit. Or people go, do you know what? It makes sense to me. I'm going to give that a try. Where can I get this course? Because the Alpha course is very popular in prisons, eh? Yeah, yeah, it runs in prisons as well. And out. So you can go to your local church and inquire about the Alpha course. Yeah. So life now then, how did the book and stuff come about? Guns to God? How's this? Yeah. Bad boy get about my journey from drug dealing to deliverance. Yeah. A heart wrenching and beautiful story of transformation. Yeah. How did this come about? 
Um, actually, it started in 2010 when I was in therapy. So I've had, like you said, suicide in for men is the number one killer. For men between, I think it's 25 and 45. Yeah. Suicide rate is the number one killer. <clears throat> if we actually embrace what that means, imagine that, the death toll for men, nothing else is killing men more than suicide between mm -hmm. 25 and 45. So in 2010, when I began therapy and counselling, I was... Um, I was loaded, mate. I was going like twice a week, riddled with anxiety. And uh, my therapist said, you know, one of the ways you can, it, it was therapeutic is sometimes to write. So um, I couldn't tell anyone else about my woes and she was sworn to confidentiality. Um, so I started writing. And then some years later, someone approached me a couple of years ago and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I'm an author, but I know I've got some diaries and some pads stashed somewhere and um, I dug them out, finished them off and boom, you know, the, the, uh, we came up with that. Where can people buy your book, Claude? If people Google me online, Claude Jackson, Claude without an E, Guns to God, it will pop up or Amazon or SPCK is the publishers. Um, yeah, you'll be able to get it online or order it, Waterstones, WH Smith's. It's available. Yeah, we'll leave the links in the description. Looking back in your life, what do you think? What a hot mess. <laughs> what a hot mess, brother. Personally, I found my freedom through Jesus, whom I tell you what, Jesus is real, brother. I just wish I encountered him earlier, you know. But it's been a hot mess, but there's always hope, man. How's your brothers and stuff treat you now? Are you in a good contact or have they drifted apart? Yeah, we've all drifted off. A couple of them don't talk to me. Why? You'd have to ask them. Um, a lot of it's got money to do. I think people think there's bread floating about. I don't know. We're all so vindictive, manipulative human beings. I couldn't possibly tell you exactly why, but we just don't get along. Maybe we don't see eye to eye. And um, yeah, it's just family. You know, everyone's got a, a motive for their behaviour. And I'm just trying to walk a straight line, bro. I, I, I Mate... I fail every day. I can't live up to my own expectations. So anybody else, I'm going to let down. How does that affect you, trying to move forward in life? And my family. Or yeah, my own. family. Mate, uh, we're vessels, bro. I'm, I'm really looking for eternity, bro. My time on earth is just for others to, sh to share with them, bro. Seriously, man. Uh, I just want my life to be for others and help people to conquer their fears and get over their demons. And the mad thing is, here's something for the naysayers, which is interesting to say the least for me. If I'm telling you something that changed my life for the better and it could change yours for the better, how is that bad? I'm not taking any money off you. I'm not asking you to commit a crime. I'm not asking you to fund nothing. I don't understand how people can... I get kicked back. If I get kicked back, how that can happen? Because all I'm saying is something that changed my life for the better could change yours. Yeah. It's difficult, though, because when you start doing well, people always bring up your past. People like to... But as time goes on, you realise the past is the past for a reason. You try to learn from it. You try to make, not make the same mistakes twice so you can help guide others. Remember, people stuck in that way of thinking as well, the old mentality where... But if you're changing your life and coming out of that circle, you then become a grass, you then become, you're speaking out of school and this and that, you then become a threat to the fake bubble that's in it. But they're on that journey where they can't see that or anybody that's in that life. Because when I started making changes, like it becomes difficult because you question yourself. Am I going fucking crazy? Part of me thinks, yeah, I was. Like, I end up doing a Reiki course, man, like healing energy and... The, for where I came from to what I used to do and what I was involved in to then sitting in this house with fucking six older women trying to heal each other with her hands. It felt, it felt normal to me. It felt good. And then I've posted my certificate to say, look, I'm a Reiki master. And I get fucking slaughtered because it's the unknown. The fear of the unknown. Nobody doesn't understand that. But yet, so they will project their fears onto you. I don't understand that. What the fuck is that weirdo doing? Because I'm not standing in a pub anymore snorting lines, because I don't want to do turns, because I don't want to do bad shit to make my money, because I don't want to see any more pain and misery. Like, my family's seen enough pain and misery in my own family and also caused it in other families. Like, I don't want to see that anymore. I'm sick of the screams. I'm sick of the nightmares. I'm sick of 
the bullshit. So what do you do? Make adjustments. Write down what I needed to change. And it's been a seven-year process. Had a couple of relapses along the way. Still think about going fucking mental from time to time. But I'm a human being. I'm a working process. I don't shy away. And that's where the, the beauty is. That there's always keys in there to unlock doors of your potential. And everybody's got potential. Everybody's got greatness. Everybody can be a great individual and learn from their mistakes. It's because when you start making changes as well, you worry about your past. Because... What that then does is puts people back in their box again because they think, fuck me, I'm not wanting to be anything special because it's the pressure that comes with that, the hate and rage that comes with that makes you want to step back and just become an average Joe. But I want to be great, man. I want to leave potential. I want to leave a legacy and, and show what can be done by pushing through the pain, pushing through the obstacles and, and raising to be better. But it's constant pressure on yourself. Do you feel that also when you start making changes to then try to become a better person because the, the past, I always think about the past even though I'm always about trying to concentrate on the power of now the past always slips in so for you go through that journey turning to Christ and writing a book how much does the past come into play? Sure um, I think that's really important to highlight it's it's weird brother because I think people if I see someone trying to train, train for a marathon yeah, instead of telling them they're going to fail I'm the sort of guy that wants to train just to see if I could do it as well. Yeah. Maybe even do it a bit quicker. I'm just wired like that. So when I think, when people, I think, take a negative, because they say attack is the best form of defense, I think it's their own vulnerabilities and wounds. And bro, I feel your hurt in it. Like, I, I know your hurt, I see your pain, bro. I see the brokenness in you, we're all broken. So if someone wants to throw my past up, Bro, so be it. Because I'm not trying, I wrote a book, I'm not trying to deny it. I tell people every day, I am flawed, mate, and I'm going to make mistakes every day. Because guess what? We're never going to be perfect. So if you can look at me and say, all right, do you know what? Or look how far James has come and he hasn't had an easy time. Maybe I can do it too. That's what I don't get. Join the marathon, bruv. Run the race with us, you know? Uh, I don't understand why people would try and discredit or harm bring some sort of negativity to the positivity um i think they're fearful and it's all right to be scared you know i'm, I'm broken i'm scared every day brother i'm gonna make a hot mess of everything every day of the week bro and uh but i'm just putting it out there because why pretend to be perfect and whole when you're not and you probably never will be yeah the truth sets you free for, for real bro yeah. it's a pursuit for freedom for anybody that's maybe going through a struggle brother that's <clears throat> maybe battling with mental health what advice would you give for them seek help first and foremost seek professional advice get um speak to a doctor speak to someone tell someone mental health is not a joke like we said it's the number one killer for men under 45 so definitely address that what about for anybody that's maybe wanting to go down the route you went down what advice or how can they get in contact with you? Um, you can contact me on Facebook. You can contact me on my Instagram, Claude Jackson LDN. I'll be happy to talk with them. And that's, mate, I don't care if you're still caught up in it and you're still active, like, or you want to try and pursue the road I've gone down and find more wholeness in life and answers. Let's do it. Brother, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, no, no. It's been a pleasure to be here, James. You're an absolute legend. Thank you. And uh, more power to you, brother. And like I said, anyone that wants to reach out, mate, I'm, I'm a message away. I'll get back to you. That's what I'll get back to you. I know a lot of these guys online, bruv. Uh, you know what I mean? Because when I met you there, how, how tall are you? 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, I'm about 6'8". Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a, yeah, yeah. Hell, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a big... And that myth about tall people and basketball is a lie, bro. Yeah. I joined a basketball team some years ago and it was rough stuff, mate. A uh -huh. lot of elbows to the head and yeah. I said, nah, I, got to, I can't do this much longer. Yeah, that's... Like, did you not use that... Did you become more of a target then for people? Like, being so tall, or did you use it as an advantage to bully? I mean, in my early days, I got bullied and I became a bully. Yeah. In my teens, I never had a one-on-one -on -one in my life, bruv. In clubs and raves and pubs, I was always, there was always 10, 20 guys who tried to rush me or, and you know, I had to hit the fire exit or grab a tool and calm everyone down. Because, you know, it's whatever 
whenever, wherever. That was my mindset. So, yeah, I was always outnumbered, just being a big guy, but it comes with the territory. But I was never strong enough for them, just to tell the truth. Yeah. I've never, I always had to do a runner or something like yeah. that, brother. But thanks for your honesty, brother. Oh, Claude, mate, it's been God an absolute you. pleasure. Thanks, and look James. forward to see what you do for the rest of the future, brother. Thank you, bro. God thanks. bless you, bro. Cheers, James.